Good afternoon, my friends, and welcome to the 2023 Page Lecture in honor of poet and visual artist Joanne Page. Uh, my name's Sam McKegney, and I'm the head of the English department, and I'll do a bit of the emceeing this evening or this afternoon. Uh, I wish to acknowledge and reckon with the reality that Queen's University occupies Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe lands and that I'm a settler and uninvited guest in these territories. Further, as the death toll rises in Gaza, I wish to recognize the connections amongst expressions of colonial dispossession, confinement and oppression on Turtle Island and globally. The Page Lecture is always a highlight of the year in the English department, generously supported by Steve Page, the Page family, and Joanne's many friends. The Page Lecture brings an esteemed Canadian writer to campus to share their reflections on the evocative prompt of the Page. And before I get into some background about the lectureship series, um, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things. One, um, we are obviously outside of the English department. We're sorry the balcony renovations are not done yet, so we can't be in Watson Hall. But next year, next year at the Page Lecture, uh, we will be able to have a reception. Hopefully it'll be nice out, we'll be on the balcony, we'll have a glass of wine, we'll be looking at the water, and we'll be thinking about all things uh, beautiful and literary. Uh, but here we are uh, in Kingston Hall, and that means uh, due to the fact that we're on the second floor, there are no restrooms on this floor. So if you need to use the restroom, they will either be one floor above or one floor below. The other housekeeping thing I wanted to note is that uh, the reception for the Page Lecture will be held at the Grad Club, which is on the corner of Barry and Union. So uh, a number of us will be walking directly there, and for those of you who don't know where that is, please walk along with, uh, or we can meet you over there, and uh, we'd love to join in some fellowship and, and further the conversations in that space. Now, I've been coming to the Page Lecture for a long time now. Uh, the Page Lecture is, I believe, 13 years old now, but it's in that ballpark. And um, when I first came to a page lecture event as a, a fairly, fair, something of a newbie of a faculty member, I thought, geez, this is a little different than many of our events in the research forum series. The research forum series tends to have an audience almost entirely of graduate students and some faculty. And I thought, the dominant hair color is slightly different at the, <laughs> at the page lecture. Um, but more so, there is, uh, is a form of, of camaraderie and joy at the Page Lecture and community that is, is truly palpable. And you can see it or hear it with the conversations that were evolving at the start uh, of this event. And there's clearly a creative community of which Joanne was such an integral part that, that continues to this day, and that uh, I, I really hope our graduate students in the room take note of and, and participate in. And I have an illustrative example that we'll start off with today that I think uh, shows how special the Page Lecture is. A uh, longtime participant and contributor to the English Department in Creative Writing here at Queen's, Elizabeth Green, reached out to me recently in an email and, uh, and she said she had been reading Sotto Voce by Maureen Hines and uh, was reminded of a poem written uh, about or to Maureen's and, well, Elizabeth's friend, uh, Joanne Page. And she said, wouldn't it be great to bring that poem into this space, you know, in order to, to remind ourselves of, of Joanne? And I said, absolutely, 100%, I'd be happy to read that poem. And then I was like, why would I read that poem? I wonder if Maureen's going to be coming. And it turns out Maureen's been to every single one of the page lectures that we've had in person, even though she lives in Toronto. And we are very fortunate that she has said yes to reading said, said poem to us today to start us off in a good way. So I will invite Maureen up while I introduce her. So Maureen Hines lives in Dish With One Spoon territory in Toronto and is the author of six collections of poetry, including Take the Compass, her first collection won the Gerald Lampert Award, and she's been shortlisted or a finalist for numerous other literary awards. Her work appears in several anthologies, and Maureen has taught in the U of T's creative writing program. Please join me in welcoming Maureen Hines. Thanks so much, 
Sam, and thanks everyone for coming out. It's such a great honor to be invited to do this, and I'm so grateful to Elizabeth for suggesting this, even though the whole project of doing this makes me nervous. But <laughs> I'll read the poem. Um, it's called Dearest Friend. So, dearest friend, shouldn't we write down our smallest, most honest questions, courier them to our friends and family, require monthly replies so that vast rips and holes caused by all the questions we didn't ask won't torment us, lying awake after their deaths. Dearest friend, am I indulging my sorrow? Your long sickness, your early departure, Troubled, turning 70 in a way you'd never been birthday troubled before. Always a shout of gladness for another year to dive into. Oh, if I could have kept you here with crabapple jelly, I would have pilfered fruit from every tree in the county, stood over boiling pots of coral-colored steam through heat wave days and lightning nights. Dearest friend, we had so many long and urgent conversations, gripes and gardens and grandchildren, must read lists, how to transform disappointment into art. Could I not unlock those hours from some vault or archive, take them out and redeem them, the way you pawned an old diamond ring from your safety deposit box to get some money for a single mother? Those hours now treasure cached in some great chieftain's burial chamber, holding not wet stones and scepters, Celtic bowls and tosses of gold coins inside ivory purses, but your wit and talent for friendship. Oh, the evergreen riches. Thank you so much, Maureen. That was absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and certainly moves our event in the right direction this afternoon. I'm so excited for the presentation ahead. When our Creative Writing Committee identified Rita Wong as our top choice for page lecturer this year, I was thrilled. Knowing the complexity, beauty, intricacy, joyfulness, and uh, exacting nature of Rita's poetry knowing that she would bring so much to this lecture series. Her work deftly deploys the word and the page to provoke in the reader reflections on land and water and food and responsibility, as well as considerations of implicatedness in ongoing colonial dispossession and environmental degradation. Professor of Literature and Creative Writing at Emily Carr College of Art and Design, Wong is the author of multiple books of poetry including Monkey Puzzle from 1998, Forage from 2008, which won the Dorothy Livesay, uh, Livesay Prize, and Undercurrent from 2015. Deeply collaborative, Wong is the co-author with Larissa Lai of Sybil Unrest, with Cindy Mochizuki of Perpetual, and with former page lecturer Fred Waugh of Beholden, a poem as long as the river. She is also the co-editor with Dorothy Christian of Downstream Reimagining Water. Her 2021 selected collection of poetry, which should be required reading for all of us who muse on the role of literary expression in confronting the most urgent issues of our time, is entitled Current Climate, the Poetry of Rita Wong. And note that there is a comma between current and climate. It came out with uh, Wilfrid Laurier Press in uh, 2021. Uh, the talk that will be delivered, as you see upon, uh, upon the screen there, has the beautiful title, Pages from a Book of Relentless Grief and Persistent Love. Please join me in welcoming Rita Wong. Thank you, Sam, for that lovely introduction, and thank you, all of you, for coming today. Um, I really appreciate uh, your presence. Um, I am really humbled and happy to be here on uh, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people's territory today with you um, on this beautiful campus so close to Lake Ontario, uh, pictured here. Um, 
it's been such a challenging time. I'd like to start with a minute of silence to um, honor and hold in our hearts the, the thousands of people that have died in the last few weeks in both um, Palestine and Israel. And I am going to talk through this a little bit more, uh, but let's just take a moment of silence, if we may, please. Thank you. Um, it's been a time where I haven't known what to say, and it has been um, hard to find words. Um, but I would like to say that if my silence could bring back the lives of all those people who've been killed, I would walk out of this room right now and I would stop writing in a heartbeat. But my silence is not gonna bring them back. And, and so um, I'll share with you what I can today and hope that we can talk during the Q&A. Um, when I first arrived here, and can you hear me in the back? Is the sound okay? Um, I took some time to walk to the lake and introduce myself to it uh, to thank the water uh, for the life that it provides all of us, and to ground myself here even just briefly. I was surprised uh, and glad to meet a couple of ginkgo trees in the forefront, the foreground there, near the hospital. The ginkgos are medicine to me. Uh, it's a tree that helps with memory and also with persistence. Um, there are stories about ginkgos surviving the Hiroshima bombing. Um, so ginkgos, have a lot to teach us about uh, persistence. And there's so much to remember, uh, so much to hold and to share, as well as so much to let go of when we can no longer carry it. So we're living through devastating time on many fronts, and the title of this talk is a nod of respect to the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, um, particularly his book, Journal of an Ordinary Grief. Um, in that book he writes, quote, when the storm dispersed them, the present was shouting at the past. It's your fault. And the past was transforming its crime into a law. As for the future, it was a neutral observer. And though I am living and writing in a different context than Darwish, his description of crimes being given an alibi through law resonates with me. As I have witnessed this unfold through the violation of indigenous law, and how the imposition of colonial law has taken from and harmed the land on such a scale that we now find ourselves in an accelerating climate crisis. How we respond to this crisis will determine what kind of future we have ahead of us. In the middle of a storm, it can be hard to know how to get out or when it will end. Some days I feel like Benjamin's angel being blown by the storm of progress with my back to the future and my eyes on the, on the growing debris. Other days I bend down low and I sit on the earth, grateful that it continues to hold me up somehow. Today I'd like to share four moments uh, from a decade or more of following the waters where this journey has taken me um, and some of what I've been privileged to witness and participate in. Moments of both immense heartache and incredible joy. If we consider the earth, the land, the forests, the river as the original library, the original home of all knowledge, these are just a few pages torn from my small journal of a lifelong journey. 
And I want to be clear that while this journey is from my point of view, I am just a small part of a much larger process and much larger patterns than me. And I hope that by sharing some of my witnessing, this may be of service to you. So, by way of introduction, uh, I began this journey in 2007 that I continue to be on today, and that is of listening and paying attention to what the waters teach us. I began this as a response to the invitations circulated by Dorothy Christian and Denise Nadeau, who organized a gathering with the intention to bring together people from all four directions for the sake of water, whose health is our health. Dorothy, who is a Chippewa and Silk visual storyteller, uh, she and I met at a gathering that Lee Miracle organized in 2002, bringing together Indigenous uh, and Asian women writers. Both Lee and Dorothy have been inspirations to me, guiding me on my lifelong path. And so Dorothy and I eventually organized a gathering called Downstream, Reimagining Water in 2012, which is collected in this anthology. And I continue to be guided today by what Lee Miracle said at that gathering, that the water owns itself. And here, to me, this means that Lake Ontario owns itself. I'm just grateful for the lake's generosity and its patience with us. I'm also guided by Dorothy's question, can you love the land like I do? And in following that question, I find that loving the land comes with a lot of heartache, but also a lot of joy. So my ancestors come from the Pearl River Delta in southern uh, China, and I was born in and grew up in Treaty 7 territory, also known as Calgary. For more than half of my life, I've had the good fortune to live in the unceded Coast Salish territories known as Vancouver. Vancouver is a city that is powered in large part by the hydroelectric dams that provide British Columbia with energy. When I turn on the light in Vancouver, I am connected to the dams up north on the Peace River, as well as the dams along the Columbia River. These dams caused massive, massive destruction of indigenous homelands, displacement of peoples, animals, medicines, and intergenerational trauma that continues today. I did not choose this history, and I would not have agreed to this structural violence, but I didn't have a choice in that. It is what I have inherited. And as someone who lives in the, in the province of BC, I cannot change this painful past, but what I can change is how I respond to it by refusing to ignore the harms that have been inflicted that still need to be repaired and healed. And this becomes very apparent as I follow the rivers and learn from them and from their people that I have a responsibility to share what I witness. And as my partner Stacy says, a responsibility, to, a responsibility to live. So today I'll share four moments along um, four rivers. First, going east from Vancouver towards the Columbia River. Uh, in this map, you don't see the Columbia, it's a, but you'll see it in the next uh, slide. Um, first, going east from Vancouver towards the Columbia River as it flows through the homelands of the Katunaha, Sinaiks, Chippewa, Okanagan, and many more nations. Then heading north to the Peace River in Danaza territory, which you'll see in the top right corner of this uh, slide and then heading west towards the Wet'suwet'en Kwa, also known as the Morris River, in Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, which you can see on the map there. And then finally, lastly, south back to um, where I currently make my home, the Stachlo or Fraser River, as it joins the Salish Sea. I could easily spend the entire talk staying in just one of these rivers uh, and connecting to the people there. But all four of them have much to teach us, and their interconnections are important to acknowledge. So I'm stretching myself a little bit today, and I hope you will stretch along with me. Um, a way to summarize this talk is to consider it a glimpse into two megadams, two pipelines encroaching upon four rivers, with the understanding that there's always much more than this going on. But I can only share what I've witnessed through spending time with people along these rivers. Rivers which are lifelines, what Frida Hassan of the Unistoten calls the original critical infrastructure. Um, 
I'd like to start with reading some excerpts from the book Beholden, which Fred Waugh and I wrote along the sides of the Columbia River. Uh, and it's a scroll in its original form, but it's also a book that challenges the page by going off the page all the time. <laughs> um, and the words flow over the margins and rush past each page, all the way from the headwaters of the river to the mouth that enters the Pacific Ocean. Words pile up like a log jam, damn debris, rip rap, trouble brewing like a slow moving train wreck, signaling maps are not enough, unless they are put to the purpose of making a home for elk, caribou, bear, beaver. Imagine salmon when she swam here for thousands of years before the long, loud, loaded train rumbling through the night, carrying its deadly freight on schedule for the demon of speed, chugging track by track, endless till it's not. Body listens, lying on the ground, skull, ear, shoulder, rib, hip, thigh, calf, ankle, foot, toe, everything supported by earth as dream engulfs the dreamer. Return to the story that is going on with or without you through intervals of destruction for temporary power or storage that costs more than money can buy. The trees need the river and the river needs the trees and we need both river and trees in ways that are buried in bone and sinew, uncanny returns. Shifting baseline syndrome, no excuse for not learning the cultures of this land. Better late than never to not take abundance, generosity, or humility for granted on this spinning earth. Keep the language and the story honest. Don't call a reservoir a lake. Don't naturalize the hubris. Don't hide the arrogance of destroying what you don't understand. Listen for what's underneath the narrative of convenience, the inadequacy of speed and progress, or its deadly outcome from the perspective of trees and herons and wolves who remember the before, the during, and the after as we wait for the leap to take hold or the machinery of greed to dig a mass grave for those who refused to learn to respect the land, the river, and those who are unwilling or unable to stop them. Waiting for them to wake up won't work. Listen to the changing weather. Teach others to listen. Some capitulate to Stockholm Syndrome. Some are declared extinct, but they remain sunnixed, not vanishing as Christos foretold. After the flooding of homes, farms, hunting grounds, graves, after the forced evictions, after the burning, the evidence, the violence, the indifference, after the betrayal, the inadequacy, the mistakes. The ghosts, the spirits, the survivors remain and they remember the future. Creeks tumble down to the reservoir, no longer lake, once witness to caribou herds. The river does not end at its shores but flows slowly through the trees and the grass, the electrical fields and the logging yards, the hum of the refrigerator and flash of your cell phone, relying on river, whether you know it or not. River as archive of rain, pesticides, urban debris, rural runoff, river as encryption of political power, river as an exodus of endangered species, leaping upstream to bash against concrete blockage, banal abomination, impervious to kinship of life. Yet kinship of rivers flags another path for allegiance to take, the union of the living, from tardigrade to tributary, otter to osprey, grandparent to guardian. There are certain phrases from this excerpt that I just read for you, um, endless till it's not, unable to stop them, and listen to the changing weather that carry both grief and warnings for me. The ease and convenience that comes with plentiful hydroelectricity have an ecological cost, whether we know what that is or not. Hydro dams remove the living communities and carbon sinks we call forests, and they also release methane and mercury into the environment. When considering mega dams, the flooding of sacred places and the deadening of living rivers. There are massive costs we cannot underestimate. 
in considering the history of the dams on the Columbia, um, British Columbia had a two rivers policy in the 1960s by which the mega dams on the Columbia generated money from the United States for things like flood control payment that were used to build the two dams on the Peace up north. The damming of the two rivers is financially and politically linked. And this takes me north to the second page, torn from what I've lived, a glimpse into the Peace, a river that I depend on daily for electricity even though I live so far away from its flows. Um, I'll share a poem called River Sisters that was written for the piece. Uh, it appears online through Rung Magazine and also in the anthology Land Relations. And this is a photo that I took. It's not a great photo, I apologize. Um, but it gives you at least a little bit of a sense of what it looks like or looked like up there before the dam. From the Pearl River to the Peace River, I've walked among river killers, serial killers in suits wielding bureaucracy to disguise the ignorance and arrogance of patriarchs who thought they knew best, but refused to see or care about the dying baiji, the disappearing moose. When they try to flood the river's curves, they would smother her forest-loving song, bloat her body with their greed and ego, silencing millennia-old bird song forgetting that the river belongs to herself, not to them. The ghosts pile up with the toxic mistakes in the patriarch's drive to power as they gamble away the haunted house we call Earth, watershed home. The spirits of those who've had their homes stolen and destroyed know how money talks loud, but the Earth bats last. We call on these spirits to help people change their river-murdering ways before it is too late. And this poem is dedicated to Dai Ching, Bing Ai, Feng Yan, Arundhati Roy, Helen Knott, Yvonne Tupper, and Connie Gray Eyes. Um, some of these women uh, tried very hard to um, resist and protest the Three Gorges Dam, which is a dam in China that is so large that it may have added a wobble to the Earth's rotation. Uh, Arundhati Roy, I think, is well known for her work uh, trying to protect rivers as well. And the other, uh, Helen, Yvonne, and Connie are women I've met up north while I was up in the Peace. And so by a coincidence, I happened to be up in the Peace region in the summer of 2015 for a decolonizing water bush camp where BC Hydro started cutting down trees that housed eagles' nests for the Site Sea Dam. And this was a total accident or coincidence. There was a spontaneous river ceremony held, which I attended. Um, instead of going to the panels that I was supposed to be attending, we just dropped everything, Dorothy and I, and took off for this ceremony. Um, and along with elders, kids, dogs, moms, and everyday river-loving people from the West Moberly and Soto First Nations, we sang and prayed as security boats and helicopters surveyed us. And this was the beginning, or my entry point into the beginning, of the waste of billions of dollars that would be sunk into the Site C Dam. Over the years since then, I've made annual pilgrimages to the river to connect with the people who are trying to protect it and to keep praying for the dam to stop, for the river's life to prevail over those who would choke it a third time killing off the chances for wildlife to seek refuge on its islands. That island that you can see in the photograph has been all clear cut and is no longer uh, the way it is. Uh, and many of the islands in the river have been um, clear cut. Anyways, uh, killing off the chances for the wildlife to seek refuge on its islands. And they use these islands to nurse their young and to... <clears throat> um, um, to basically grow large enough. And so the Dunaza have a history of not hunting on these um, places to give the wildlife a chance to live. They do hunt elsewhere, but not on the islands, which are also known as jewels of the peace. Irreplaceable tufa seeps with the cleanest, most delicious waters you've ever tasted have been sac sacrificed and killed for this dam. That brutally reduces the land's natural resilience, turning a, sac a sacred, fertile, diversely used place into a big battery for BC. 
on my most recent visit to the Peace Valley this past summer, um, and this was taken a few years ago, actually. Um, this is just one of hundreds of clear cuts in the valley. Um, we're talking about over 100 kilometers of land, right? We're talking about a, a huge area. Um, but this past summer, a huge area of northern BC was subsumed in smoke from the Donny Creek wildfire, the largest wildfire in British Columbia's history, covering an area larger than the province of Prince Edward Island. The inescapable smoke left me with a cough that lingered for weeks afterwards. It feels like the accelerating and intensifying wildfires are the Earth's way of telling us that we're on the wrong path when we decimate forests for everything from pipelines to forestry to mega dams. The dams in the piece, and I apologize for the next photo, um, it's a heartbreaking one, but I, um, I think when we look at destruction from a distance, we sometimes distance ourselves from it, and so it's also important to go up close to it. And the dams in the piece are a betrayal of Treaty 8, which is supposed to last as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. I've been struggling with grief over the loss of these irreplaceable inheritances that existed when I was born, but will have been wrecked and desecrated in my lifetime. This is just one of hundreds of these burn piles, right? Just to give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about. I live with a bitterness that the colonial governments that I don't want to speak for me have broken Treaty 8. I live with a rage for the beavers that have been drowned by BC Hydro's contractors, the eagles that have been displaced through clear cutting, the people whose ancestors have been done wrong yet again. At the same time as that, I also live with a huge respect and love for the people who continue on, somehow, in the face of massive structural violence repeating itself yet again. I honor the perseverance of writers like Helen Knott from the Prophet River First Nation, who is featured in the film Peace River Rising, when she tells Prime Minister Trudeau in a poem that you can find on CBC that this land is her ancestors' living memory. Her plea to Canada to protect the Peace Valley and stop the Sight Sea Dam fell on unresponsive ears, but Helen continues to love her ancestral land and its peoples. She recently launched her book, Becoming a Matriarch, asserting her voice and her matriarchal lineage in the, system, sorry, in the face of a system that would silence her. In this book, she writes of speaking to reporters about the violence women have experienced while their territory is being impacted by oil and gas extraction and large-scale projects like Site C, and about persistently having to educate people about the connection between land and body violence. Despite the horrific violence inflicted by the destruction of the sacred river, she keeps finding ways to do what she can, to live and tell a much fuller story than what colonization would have consigned her to. She writes, land is a memory and it denies our colonial categorizations of time because it is the longest living record keeper. And there is so much more to her book than I can say here, but I urge you to all read it and share it. I would much rather share joy than heartbreak with Helen, but there's definitely both. The massive bulldozers and corporate tentacles are big, but the Earth's natural systems are bigger, and people violate these systems at our own peril. If the Site C Dam comes into commission, if it's not stopped by another landslide, and there have been two so far since they started building this dam, and this is a region that's full of fracking and industrial extraction, if it's not stopped by another landslide or massive forest fire, then it will likely power the expansion and fracking that is planned in northeastern British Columbia. At a time when everywhere from the United Kingdom to New York State to Quebec have banned fracking, BC's decision to keep fracking is horrific and frankly irresponsible, given the amount of climate devastation and poisoning of water that it will lock in. A number of proposed fracked gas pipelines. Um, the euphemism LNG is often used, and I refuse to use that word anymore. I call it methane gas because that's what it is. Um, the number of proposed methane gas pipelines that have been stopped by the strategically located Unistoten Healing Center. Oh, I'll switch over. Um, So 
So the, there have been a number of proposed gas pipelines that have been stopped by the strategically located Unistone Healing Center, it's, that's the website, um, which reemphasizes the connection between the land and the body that I mentioned with Helen. Um, the Unistone Healing Center is roughly an eight hour drive west of the piece, but currently the coastal gas link pipeline has continued to trespass on Wet'suwet'en territory despite being issued an eviction notice by Wet'suwet'en hereditary leaders who hold the responsibility to protect the lands and the waters. And this brings me to moment number three. I first met supporters of the Unistoten Healing Center at the Healing Walk for the Tar Sands in 2011, and I had the honor of visiting and contributing volunteer labor uh, to the building of the center. And definitely not my strong point, not one of my skills, but you do what you can when you show up. In one of my po on one of my visits to the Healing Center, I met the poet Jennifer Wickham uh, from the Gidendun clan. And she says in her poem, In Gusi Wedzen Kwa, that the river is her healer, a consoling friend, a life giver, a grandmother, a sister to the ancient ones. When Gidim Den built their access point in solidarity with Unistoten, which was raided by the RCMP in 2019, this took a level of courage and commitment that was fueled by the river itself. The river teaches us love and long-term perspective. The river teaches us persistence and flow. The river keeps going on, despite being drilled under, threatened by fracking corporations, and seeing the forests along its banks clear-cut for a pipeline that is an abomination and a violation of Wet'suwet'en law. So just when I'm talking about Wet'suwet'en law or indigenous law, I just want to distinguish that from Aboriginal law. I think most people in the room know the difference, but indigenous law was here already, has always been here, and Aboriginal law is law relating to indigenous peoples in the colonial courts of Canada. So it's, a, it's an important distinction because the indigenous laws are here, have been here, were here before. And as I, as, I wrote for the National Observer in 2019. I witness how the Wedson Kwa, the Morris River, still runs cold, clear, and delicious. So clean that we can drink the water directly from the river without treating it or dousing it with chlorine. This is precious, rare, and worthy of protection. The river water enters me and becomes part of me as I gratefully swallow it and I in turn become part of this land and water that sustains me. We cannot, we cannot afford to forget our gratitude to the land that provides, that has a larger spirit and intelligence that we can learn from when we are humble and attentive. The arrogance of endless extraction expansion is a dead end that turns the land's gifts into poisoned trash, forgetting reciprocity in this drive to consume at all costs. When the Wet'suwet'en renew their relations with the land, we all benefit and learn from this. And so I see people coming from far away to stand in solidarity with the Unistoten and get them done. Um, I understand there's a panel happening uh, soon that will go into this more, but just to um, mention that over, it, it says almost, but I think more than 50 million by now has been spent uh, by the RCMP to fight indigenous land protection and in, in, within the last three years. So the amount of money that is being wasted to criminalize indigenous land defenders is something that I just cannot be silent about either. And this is a still from a video that Gidim Dem put out um, in the last year that they've been patrolled by the RCMP more than 200 times, and also that individual officers have trespassed onto their land uh, more than 700 times. The amount of violation of Indigenous law that's happened is unforgivable, in my opinion, and yet we still have to find ways to keep going on. This Today, as I speak, this week, um, they, uh, there is a court hearing happening for Sabina Dennis, who is one of the women who is criminalized for protecting the Yinta. And when Jennifer Wickham describes the river as her grandmother, this resonates with me. As I live at the mouth of the Stahlu, which can be described many ways, including as a 12 million year old elder that carries Rocky Mountain sediment to the Pacific Ocean in its perpetual flow. 
Um, I hope we can discuss this more during the q and I'm, I'm, It's hard for me to keep moving on. <laughs> I just want to keep staying. But I, I'm, in the interest of time, I will keep going. Um, and this brings me closer to home, moving south from Wet'suwet'en territories to moment number four, which begins with hearing Kaya George from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation say that Tsleil-Waututh, the Burrard Inlet, is her community's oldest grandmother. Kaya George just premiered a new film at the Vancouver International Film Festival called Our Grandmother the Inlet. To call a body of water your grandmother is to remember that we're part of the Earth's cycles, part of its watery interconnectedness. My phone has the same ring. Thankfully, it's not mine, though. Um, and in this film, as Kaya skateboards across the paved surfaces of the watershed and immerses herself into the inlet, she's a living example. She's living water, like literally. She's reminding us to listen to and to respect her grandmother. Kaya is also the daughter of Reuben George. And great-granddaughter of Chief Dan George. And her father, Reuben George, has worked through the Tselotov Sacred Trust to do their utmost to protect the inlet. Their nation has been healing the lands and waters from reintroducing elk into the territory, cleaning the water to enable clam harvesting again after many decades of not being able to because of pollution, to remediating salmon habitat and more. A lot of amazing work has happened and continues to happen, including a 1,200-page environmental assessment of the unacceptable impact the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion would have. All of this powerful healing work is endangered by the pipeline expansion. Both Reuben George and Lee Miracle are Chief Dan George's grandkids. One of the many things that Lee uh, said when she was here was that when we live on Coast Salish territories, we have a responsibility to uphold Coast Salish law and culture. Whether or not we understand this, whether or not we were even taught it, we still have that responsibility. And Reuben speaks of how this law consists of truth, family, culture, and health. He writes in his new book, It Stops Here. Our law, not samat, and not samat means that we are, all, we are all one, one heart, one mind, one spirit. Our law, not samat, told us we had to protect the inlet. That's what we did because the water is our first mother. That's what we did because the lands are like a family member to us. And we wouldn't ever sacrifice a family member for money. There's no price that you can put on the reciprocal relationship of love that we have with our lands and waters. That's who we are, and we wouldn't sacrifice it uh, at any cost. Rubin's powerful book tells the story of healing from colonial violence and trauma, and it reiterates in its own way the saying that the Unistotin have, heal the people, heal the land. This inseparability, inseparab you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> this inseparability is a crucial teaching that can bring together people from all four directions. For the past decade, I've been a small, tenacious part of the movement to try to protect the inlet and the river from the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, which poses an unacceptable threat to the safety of these waters and all the lives who rely on them, both human and non-human. Along with hundreds of people who've been arrested for obstructing and refusing to consent to the pipeline expansion, I have experienced the banal violence of the colonial courts that prioritize money and control over the health of the people and the land. Ironically, though, the more the courts exert, <clears throat> exert their control to privilege fossil fuel expansion over the health of the water, the more control they will eventually lose as the weather changes, as the climate and the earth have their final say. As the writer Erica Gies says, water always wins. That's the title of her book that I also recommend reading. People have worked hard to voice their love for the land and water in many creative ways. Uh, from working with nesting hummingbirds, to delaying clear-cutting, uh, um, to um, youths in T-Rex outfits playing badminton in the path of the pipeline, getting sentenced to jail for their life-affirming uh, efforts, to a woman spending her 80th birthday in jail for refusing to move out of the way of pipeline machinery, to name just a few examples. Um, we keep speaking in myriad ways, and so does the earth, with each summer of intensifying wildfires, unpredictable floods, and surging storms. 
One of the elders in this movement, um, co-arrestee Maxine Kaufman Lacusta, was arrested in 2021 at the age of 79 for blocking the Trans Mountain Pipeline. She wrote a book called Refusing to be Enemies, which shares personal accounts of 26 Palestinian and Israeli activists who describe their political choice to engage in nonviolent resistance to the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Interviewees poignantly describe their experiences with the struggle, and for many, the decision to abandon violence as a way to achieve justice. One Palestinian activist, Mustafa Sheke Samha, describes his feelings this way. We, Palestinians and Israelis, are as if we are in a boat in the middle of the sea. So we have the responsibility to protect this boat, to reach the beach. And we cannot reach this beach by hating each other, by killing each other. We can reach this beach if we feel deeply our humanity, if we believe that we have to live together and we both have the same right to be alive. From Christos to Helen Knott to Jennifer Wickham to Kaya George and Reuben George, all these river sheds have indigenous storytellers who uphold the laws of the rivers and the lands, who remain connected to natural law. Their continuance and their perseverance in the face of a voracious machine that knows no grace is what gives me the commitment to keep going and is also what grandmothers like Maxine recognize as wisdom. A system that would rather imprison hundreds of people, including me, for trying to protect us from climate disaster is a death machine. The apocalypse has been unfolding for hundreds of years already. And in one sense, I feel like I'm always too late. But at the same time, there's much worth living for, and it is never too late to recommit to life itself. Each page I've shared today has been a note to help us navigate the waterways and the lands that decompose the debris and eventually turn it back into life. And I'd like to close by giving the last words to Lee, whose ancestral territories and waterways my life is bound with. In her essay, Water, for the Downstream Anthology, she writes, I want to say that I will always be looking for Salish landscapes. I will always yearn for the water that was Falls Creek, the marshes that were Richmond, the marshes and berry fields that were at John Henry Park and all over the territory. I will always yearn for how the abundance was considered everyone's. We have been denied so much that we are terrified of sharing with each other. The waters of the inlet, Selwatuth, still want to be water they don't want to be covered in cement and docking facilities. Covering them with cement is not progress to us, nor is it progress for the water. I will always want our trees. I will always hunger for our foods. And I will always want sovereignty. Like the water, I will never give it up. And I have children and grandchildren who feel exactly like me. We do not own the water. The water owns itself. We are responsible for ensuring that we do not damage the water. We do not have an absolute right to use and abuse the water. We must take care of the water and ensure that we have a good relationship with it. In exchange, we get to use it sparingly. In the Salish tradition, we have an obligation to the water. We also have an obligation to each other to refuse to be enemies, as Maxine puts it. And so I'd like to share part of Lee's poem, Remembering Mahmoud Darwish. It's just a poem I've been returning to again and again these days. Mahmoud's poems are beds of sweat dripping from stressed and weathered foreheads to fall near silent, uh, to fall near silent amid the incessant Israeli bombs, to rise pearls of blood from between the bits of rubble clutched by Palestinians chasing a livelihood from a shrinking land base. They become desperate word flowers, blooming nonetheless from a land, occupied by settlers, chronically stealing the lives of children. It's December, Toronto. Gaza is on fire again. Another wounded knee, another massacre. No muskets this time. Tanks, monster machines, bombs and missiles pummel the children. How brave is that? Minus 40 degrees centigrade in Winnipeg. Palestinians and indigenous children wave placards. Stop killing children in Palestine. Free Gaza. My tears freeze on my face. My daughter is there, as she was there 35 years ago, chanting, free Palestinians. My frozen tears are cutting pain lines on my face. 
In between the rubble, Darwish's last words, look at the world, say goodbye to Edward Said, peer past the camps, the bombs, and the hypocrisy, stubborn, resistant, eternal. There is no tomorrow in yesterday, so let us advance. I stare at a photo. A small boy cradles a pair of stones gleaned from the rubble. I imagine him hearing Darwish's ghostly last words from these stones. They testify that this is his home. He clutches them. He looks set to advance. The stones are no longer simply rubble. They cradle a story. They cradle his memory. They cradle his hope. They cradle Darwish's last statement. There is no tomorrow in yesterday, so let us advance. In this boy's hands, the stories transform. They are the story markers of his future. They are his beginning. Beloved stones, the last bits of some place called home. They become my stones of conscience. They are his stones of pride. They will become his stones of belonging. They are the rocks of justice for all of us. His face is set. His eyes see past this rubble. They see forward to his return, forward to the restoration of his homeland, forward to the right of return. In his eyes, I see indigenous global tenacity. I touch the stones in the photo, caress his face, commit to building a bridge, an arc of light under this wind of war, of dispossession. I want to build a pathway and blow us all toward freedom and justice. I want the wind of freedom to echo the resonance of Mahmoud's breath tracks of being. Let us pick up this stone of justice, build this bridge that will lead us to, that will lead us to the laughter of belonging, of being where we belong, of being who we are and always will be. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to join you on that beautiful and harrowing journey of witnessing uh, along those waterways. Um, we will now open it up to Q&A. And I note that we only have the one microphone, which means I'm going to be sprinting around. So the rules are, once you've asked your question, please give me the microphone back. And as Rita is responding, Others who have questions, please raise your hands at that time so I can sprint around and, and get the microphone uh, passed to folks. Okay, so who would like to begin? Hi, Rita. Um, thank you very much for the, the lecture. I was wondering about, um, I think in the First River segment, you referred a few times to remembering the future especially in relation to, I think, animal consciousness or minds. I wondered if you could say a little more about what that phrase says to you or means for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, it resonates on a number of levels, but maybe just to start, um, that, that sense of not seeing time as linear, right, as seeing it as cyclical, um, but also that um, to remember that we're part of something much bigger and larger than we are. And um, when I get that kind of perspective, it helps me to kind of put aside my own uh, ego. Like we all have, I, I know I have ego, like we all have some ego, right? And, and to kind of think about... Um, uh, when I see a future, like I don't have kids, but I, I care about, you know, I'm an auntie, I care about a lot of people's kids. I, they don't have to be my kids for me to care about them, right? And, you know, our sense of time is so, it feels like it's been shifting for me and kind of getting uh, narrower in, in some ways, shorter, like my attention span. Um, I think the technology that we're in also kind of closes that down or makes it smaller. And so, I think to actively uh, broaden it and, and um, take a long-term view, I guess. Like, I'm here because of the sacrifices and work of many previous generations who never met me and I didn't meet them, but I trust that the work that they did holds me up. 
And so my hope is to also uh, be in service of those yet to come that I have no sense of personally, right? But I, that I have a sense of uh, spiritually, maybe you could say, right? Um, and then in terms of the animals, they have a lot to teach us. And that's, that's you know, a whole lecture in and of itself. Um, but when humans remember, like there's, you know that diagram, there's a triangle and people are at the top of the triangle and it says ego. And then there's another uh, image beside it. It's a circle and people are in the middle of a circle surrounded by animals. Uh, and that's labeled eco. <laughs> um, like I think the, the sense of time, if we were to experience it from like a tree, for instance, right? Or um, a bear or that, you know, it would help, I think, people to have more humility and to maybe kind of do more kind of slowing down. Like, I, I feel like I'm on a, a cliff that's going very fast and I don't want to fall off. Um, <laughs> it's poor lemmings. They didn't ask to be described that way. Um, so maybe that's kind of where I start with it. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'll think of other things that are better later after this is over, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, um, I'm speaking sort of on behalf of a lot of my um, peers here who are in a eco-criticism literary course, and we talk a lot about um, the effects of language and specifically poetic language in the context of eco-criticism and having those conversations. What do you think poetry has to offer um, to that discussion, both in the context that you were speaking to today, but also in a broader context of climate change and, and yeah. all that? Um, thank you for that lovely question. Um, I've always been somebody that says poetry by itself is not enough, that you need a lot of other things in addition to poetry, but poetry does have a role to play. Uh, and, you know, I'm teaching an environmental ethics course right now. I'm, I'm maybe gonna pass around this anthology. I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but, um, and it's a poetry, it's an anthology that is about climate change. It's got 60 different women. It's called All We Can Save. And it's, it's different people working on different parts of the climate crisis, but it's got a lot of poetry in it, like strangely enough, like every section has different poems in it, because I think there's something about the distillation of all this experience into like a brief um, form that helps people to process, you know, just to like get it into a shape where you can kind of talk it through and come out the other side of it. Um, I think that poetry can lead you, let me put it this way, not not necessarily just poetry, but writing can lead you to all sorts of things. So sometimes I've written things in early poems that then I have to live by, <laughs> right? And he's like, oh, okay, and that means I have to do this, all right. You know, and, and so it's, it's a really good uh, learning process, you know, to share what you learn through poetry, but not only poetry. Yeah, that's where I would start with that. And I've also found that there have been a lot of poets who've inspired me and kept me going at times that I thought I would give up. Yeah, so poetry has a role to play, I would say, in helping people keep their spirits going. Oh, Nina, Rita. I don't really have a question. I just want to say that um, my reserve and uh, treaty, uh, treaty nine up is, uh, is up in Northern Ontario near Chapelot. And we are, uh, our communities, uh, part of it's on the Chapelot Game Preserve, which is supposed to be the largest game preserve in Ontario. But they have been cutting Wise Howard, Dome Tar, they've been cutting in that air territory for as long as I can remember, and we we can't stop them. They just, you know, the government just keeps doing it, and we've had protests and all that. And so I just wanted to say, I know you focused on the West Coast, but it's happening across the country. Yeah, thank you for that, Armand. I, I know that. I just, there was only so much <laughs> I could um, manage to do. <laughs> 
but I am well aware that there's uh, struggles right across Turtle Island, you know, and I think the solidarity across those struggles is really important, not just across Turtle Island, but internationally, as, as Lee was very uh, firm about, yeah. I note that we've been uh, going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> I almost didn't do it just because of that. I felt bad for you. Um, so I'm curious about, you talked about being so far away, but also being dependent on the Peace River for things that you need in your electricity. So how do you, this is an easy question. How do you reconcile those two things? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're reconcilable, but I live with the discomfort of that, right? And I live with the uneasiness of that all the time, you know? Sometimes it goes into the back of my mind because you, you can only think about it for so long, but then you come back to it, right? Um, and the, the way I try to deal with that or the way I try to put my energy is to preventing it from happening again. And I am learning that whether or not I am personally successful or the communities that I'm close to are personally successful. The earth itself, I really do believe this, the earth itself has the last say. So I hope that we can learn uh, to listen to and respect the earth instead of having, had, having it taken out of our hands, if that makes any sense. And, and so when I feel despair or um, grief about how collectively we're on the wrong path, I also remember that there's a larger system than our economy, uh, than our so-called global economy, and that larger system is, of course, the Earth, uh, the earth herself. So that's what gives me, I think, strength to keep going um, to, to the best that I can, I guess. Hi, I thank you for, like, for your lecture. I'm not sure if someone touched on, on that because I had to leave for a minute, but I was wondering um, um, what do you think um, literature, because we're a lot of English students here and I think a lot of us are thinking about a future and whether what we'll do will have an impact on the world and what do you think um, is the role of literature, of writing, um, as, a, as, a, as a, I would say, my God, I'm losing my words, but as a um, contest against all of what's happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like to think that we're capable of better stories, and a better story is something that we so badly need and that um, many of the indigenous storytellers and people, knowledge keepers I'm talking about uh, or with, um, I'll pass around a couple of the books that I had, um, they're recent, they just came out in the last month. Uh, and you know, there's a, a, a huge pile of better stories in, in terms of literature or storytelling. So I think part of it is the work of um, cultural transformation or sh paradigm shift. So like one thing I like to ask myself as well as uh, my students are what are the stories we need right now? Whose stories do we need to um, put at the center? Um, and whose stories maybe need to take some space and, and kind of make some room for uh, a shift, right? In terms of stories that teach us how to pay attention to the land, stories that foster ecological literacy, back to the eco-criticism class, the stories that have like a, um, that don't get just compartmentalized into the disciplines that we've been taught, right? When we teach, when we learn these things, we have to figure out how to reconnect them to the world around us, right? And, and so I think there's also that process. So, um, thank you, Rita, for, for bringing it all together, and especially for your way of reading the land or, or the land as a text, the rivers as a text. I was hoping maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience with Fred Wah, 
of collaborating to write about the river. Uh, um, yeah, and, and I suppose reading the river and speaking with the river and writing poetry around that. Sure. Um, that was actually a really uh, fun project to do. Any time you have a chance to follow a whole river from the headwaters all the way to the mouth, I highly recommend it. Um, it was part of a, um, a collaboration with a bunch of artists. So my colleague, Nick Camber, who teaches at Emily Carr, uh, is a, he's a visual artist. He's the one who helped us actually make the map and to write, a, a, there's no way I could have done that. <laughs> um, and so we were really lucky to be part of this um, artistic research creation team that, uh, oh yeah, I can pass it around as well. Um, and so it was not sort of just a one time trip up and down the river, there were several trips in different parts of the river and going along and spending time together and thinking together and exploring together and listening together. So at the beginning of the river, it's like a humble little marsh. And when Fred and I started this journey, I was like, you know, we have to ask permission from the river. <laughs> like we have to make an offering. And if the river says no, we're not doing this, right? Um, and from there, you know, and it's a real test of your listening skills, right? Like, are you really hearing it? Or are you just willfully, like wishful thinking? Anyways, there's a, there's a longer conversation around that. But um, we continued with it and we traveled together. And by the time you get to the place where the river enters the Pacific Ocean, it's five miles wide, right? It's the border between Oregon and Washington and it is an enormous, enormous body of water, like it transforms completely. And, and so just in terms of the process, Fred wrote on one side of the river and I wrote on the other side of the river. And I was very clear that I was gonna do everything in handwriting. And he was gonna use uh, type, uh, which he did. And you know, we, we occasionally talked, but we weren't like planning things together. And when there are resonances, they're sort of happy, um, coincidences or, you know, that something's aligned maybe is another way to think about it. Um, and so it was a really good process, but it was like a lot of learning, a steep, steep learning curve. Um, even calling it the Columbia River in some ways is problematic, absolutely. Um, and, you know, when we were visiting different communities along the river, at one point we stopped at an office and we were like, what, we want, what was the indigenous name for the river? And the person basically said, what do you mean? Like there's different names for the different river, like at, all along the river has different names, right? Why the hell would somebody name the river one thing when it's so many, like things to so many people, right? And so like this English translation has already got like this huge ego embedded into it, right? And so I struggle with that because I don't want to perpetuate that, but I also like I need a finding aid for people to try to at least get into the region, right, to be of service of it. And there's also um, treaty negotiations going on between Canada and US in terms of the Columbia River Treaty. So there's a lot of like things to kind of um, think about in terms of how you might contribute to more care for the river itself. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. Just want to make sure Sam gets his steps in. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your witnessing with us. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on the kind of like direct connection between rhythms of water and your poetic practice and how coming to know water in different qualities and different forms, you spoke about the really pure water you had the chance of encountering and then polluted waters and then salt waters and fresh waters, how that might impact as a sort of like a page for your poetry to write itself on. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that beautiful question. Um, yeah, as I was saying in Helen's class yesterday, when we look at the earth, its surface is 70% water, right? Like we would actually be more accurate to call it ocean than earth. <laughs> but here we are, you know, um, and our, the salinity of our blood is actually quite similar to the salinity of the salt water in the ocean as well. Um, and there's, Theories, I guess, um, there's a, a couple of scientists named, uh, by the last name, McNab McManon, I'm sorry, I'm garbling their name right now, 
that have a theory of hypersea that were actually little bits of ocean that crawled onto land. <laughs> um, and so if you kind of flip the script a little bit, um, it's interesting as a thought experiment whether or not it's, you know, bears out. Um, and so in terms of the rhythms of water, like, it's interesting because we live, I think, in, uh, I don't know if harmony is the right word, but in relationship to the tides, for instance, right? To uh, predictable flows of water uh, over time, right? Seasonal, you know, in Vancouver, when it rains, we know it's gonna rain for a while, <laughs> you know? Um, but the cycles are shifting in ways that are unpredictable, and that's terrifying, actually, right? Um, so that line, it's endless till it's not, right? And, and so it is, I think, a real learning to pay attention to keeping the conditions closer to the way they are when they're reliable, right? There's things you can do, right? There are, you know, you can plant, uh, not just plant, but you can work with forests, for instance, right? Forests are a huge one. I didn't talk about Fairy Creek today, but the rainforests on the West Coast are so big, they create rain, like they create weather systems, right? And when you cut those down, you're not just losing those um, ancient trees, you're also losing that rain. Like you're losing like the conditions for life, basically. So, so to think about our own little bodily patterns, but also think about how that connects to this larger hydrological cycle. So one thing I like to do with students is visit the wastewater treatment plant, which is very smelly, but it's where all of our waste goes, right? And that's us going back into the uh, ocean, basically, right? And then when it rains, uh, it, it pools in these reservoirs that we drink from. So to like, I'm really like literally mean that we're part of the watersheds that we are in, whether or not we understand that or not, whether it's conscious or unconscious. So as those things shift, we also shift. So we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. Uh, are there things that are, are burning for folks to address? Oh, yes. It's not, it's not a question, it's more like a request. Can you, have, can you share with us your, your reading list, that, your books that you... Sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, like, later on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can send it to Sam. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> yeah. no, you, go ahead. We have time for two more. Just a, a quick question about relationships. So, beautiful um, story about your journey with water um, and grief and love. So can you tell us a little bit about the human relationships that unfolded along the way? Oh, sure. Oh my God, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll start at home. Um, when all of this Trans Mountain stuff started, uh, and it's been a while, I can, in 2014 there were a bunch of mass arrests that all got thrown out. And then in 2018, there were more mass arrests. Um, but my entry into it was actually um, going to the um, Salish Sea Festival that was organized on the North Shore um, by the Tselatuth uh, community. And so uh, participating in ceremony, going into the inlet, paddling together. And I'm terrified of water, even though I write about and talk about water all the time. I'm a crappy swimmer. Um, and I am, you know, like, I, you throw me, anyways, um, but through this ceremony and through just understanding that when you paddle together, things that you can't do alone are possible. And that's like a huge thing um, for me to learn. Uh, I grew up in Calgary where I was really disconnected from the water, speaking of that. I didn't know I was drinking from the Bow River until probably like university. <laughs> Um, had no clue. Um, and so if I can learn some basic things like that, I think anybody can learn um, and needs to learn, right? Um, but in terms of the human relationships, just like showing up when people have events, showing up when people have ceremony, if you're invited. If you're not invited, don't show up, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's an open invitation to the public to get involved, then absolutely, like bring your friends, right? Um, and so, you know, I would say it's a gradual relationship building over many years. Um, 
And it's just, you know, listening and um, supporting when you can. So, and it's, it's both fun things, like there's a Christmas, uh, a Christmas fair, you know, like a craft fair that Seltoth has in early December, things like that, um, to other things, right? Uh, so that's one example in terms of the human relationships. And that there's a big difference between the community and the governments that speak for the community. And that's not only in indigenous communities, that's all sorts of communities. And the difference between the government and the people is something that we need to keep a close eye on and remember, I think. Um, um, but I also respect that governments have a, a tough job and that they do their best. So I'm not, you know, critiquing that, but I'm just saying that these structures that we're in are very challenging to work through. Um, I guess the other relationship is when I was up in the piece, so Dorothy and I show up for this river ceremony, and uh, Damien Gillis, who's a, at the time was an independent reporter, he's like, you guys, does anybody want to come? And so we were like showing up. And then we got a ride there, but we had no ride back. Um, and there were a couple of really wonderful women from Soto, uh, Yvonne and um, Pauline, who gave us a ride in their car, but their car had a weed trouble and couldn't go very fast, like it had tire trouble. Um, so we were driving on a highway that, you know, you should be going 100 on at about 40. And um, they just got us to where we needed to go after the ceremony. And those kinds of like, I don't know, just everyday sorts of kindnesses and, and gestures are also, I think, part of the journey. Like there's lots of stories like that that I could tell all night if you wanted to listen. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and so to, uh, yeah, just to kind of show up when you can and forgive yourself when you can't, you know, is, is kind of how I try to go by. Um, and let's see, I think, Oh, I mentioned the Tar Sands Healing Walk and Una Stoughton. So, um, you know, when I heard about Una Stoughton, I knew I wanted to go, but it's a long, it's not an easy way to get there, right? You have to go all the way up to Prince George, which is nine hours north of Vancouver, and then you have to get uh, across logging roads, and, you know, it's, it's like a serious, so I didn't get there for a number of years, but I knew that Una Stoughton had uh, yearly um, work camps, so one year I finally managed to get there, and that's actually where I first met Maxine, who, I, I, uh, who wrote that book, Refuse to be Enemies. Um, and like, I guess the people you meet on the journey are really amazing, and I, that is something that one should not take for granted either. Yeah, um, and all sorts of people, right? There's a wonderful photo of us on the bridge Oh, this is something I forgot to mention, but should have explained that at that time when you went into the healing center, they have a free prior and informed consent protocol. So you don't get to cross the bridge uh, unless you answer the questions well, right? There's somebody at the bridge. They're like, you know, what are your intentions? How is your visit going to benefit the earth or not? Um, are you going to harm the earth? And if you say the wrong thing, you're turned back, right? So CGL, for example, Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, was turned back, as were a number of other companies, because they couldn't say that they would not harm the land. Um, and so that sort of process used to exist, but there's a p image of us on the bridge and we have a big sign saying Black Lives Matter. And like that solidarity across four, um, four directions is something that really guides people on the front lines and on the ground, I would say. Um, there's so many pieces to it to talk about. Um, there was also solidarity with the Mohawks, right? Around Oka, the anniversary of Oka. And they, they, I think, that kind of understanding that you're part of something bigger and that people are fighting uh, for their connection to the land and water in so many places is something that can give you a, a fair amount of um, persistence, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah. We're, oh, I, okay. I'll, my apologies. It's on the English department. Blame me. We'll, we'll be out in a second. I can yeah. blame you, but otherwise... Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so I, I note that uh, we are clearly behind schedule and it's obviously my fault. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, recall that we're heading over to the grad club if people would like to uh, engage in the festivities afterward. Um, and please join me in thanking our Page Lecture for this year, Rita Wong.